<clears throat> and I hope, I don't know if that's the heat on or something. <laughs> Apologize for my voice. I sound a little, <clears throat> a little bit hoarse or something, but apologies. So um, welcome everyone to our last meeting of 2021. My, my name is Jack Glassman. I'm been chair of this committee, maybe a little too long. I don't know. <laughs> chair of the Historic Resources Committee, and I'm also a project specialist, historical ar architect with the National Park Service Regional Office. So, zooming here from the Mishawam Peninsula, as I'm now called Charlestown, uh, I'd like to acknowledge that this is a ancestral homeland of the Massachusetts and other, other peoples now in Charlestown. And my sound button. There we go. So um, I'm uh, uh, Allison may, may talk a little bit. I'm not sure if she'll talk a little bit more about uh, Mayor Wu's uh, uh, priorities and the uh, exciting um, you know, the new, new administration. But um, thanks to, especially to the Preservation Alliance, uh, when a candidate, uh, Michelle Wu, was interviewed. And I, I think people learned a lot more about her, her priorities and preservationists were very pleased to hear about her support for, uh, for strengthening the, the, the staff, for reconnecting uh, with the planning and, uh, and understanding the importance of stewardship and preservation. Uh, and, and development. So we're definitely looking forward to, uh, I think, um, strengthen, strengthen programs and, uh, and, uh, and policy uh, supporting preservation uh, as well as uh, well, the external, externalities of, uh, of uh, energy uh, conservation and so on. Just a number of items of note. Uh, uh, because of the, the presentation, I was trying to avoid sort of Boston-centric uh, news, current events, but uh, I couldn't, couldn't resist. There are a number of things that just wanted to share. I'll try to go through these uh, sort of briefly. But uh, first, uh, kind of exciting news that this is uh, uh, moving uh, at the Landmarks Commission. They voted to uh, to do a study of a site uh, in near present-day Mattapan Square. It's a it's an ancient, uh, it's a really a prehistoric uh, quarry, stone quarry, um, rhyolite, um, that um, has been, uh, as I noted, the bullet, bullet point there actually used and, uh, you know, for, as a site, a quarry site for, for making tools uh, for, for over 7,500 years. So uh, city archeologist Joe Bagley sort of represented the, uh, the tribe, this, uh, pardon my pronunciation of it's wrong, but the Sachem, Sachem Chickatabit Band of the Massachusetts people at the Ponset. So uh, he was rep kind of representing them and testifying to, uh, and, and working with the city, testifying that uh, supporting, creating uh, not only a city landmark, but also an urban wild, uh, this uh, uh, quarry site. So stay tuned, but uh, uh, and they also want to, uh, you know, continue to to have the ability to use the site for tribal activities. So uh, really cool, exciting news there. Uh, just noting the passing of Jerome Gary Rappaport, uh, developer, former uh, city hall denizen uh, during the Mayor Hines administration, helped to get him elected. Um, uh, known uh, known best, I guess, certainly by me or early on, uh, just think of them only in connection with the West End and the demolition of and displacement of thousands of families. So that uh, yeah, there's the the, uh, the pros and cons, the, the kind of the pros and cons. I guess he, he I guess to the end, he sort of stood by his the fact that he had intended to transform the city, a part of the city, and he did. He certainly transformed up through all of his philanthropic uh, activities and the centers uh, uh, that he um, uh, founded, including uh, the one at, uh, that's now part of Boston College Law School, Center for Law and Public Policy. 
Um, and um, in fact, even uh, the, the, the obituary that was in the, in the paper a couple of days ago, I saw this morning's paper, there was a letter to the editor saying like, hold, hold on a minute, it's uh, uh, you know, that, that person, the letter writer had personally experienced and been part of the uh, being uh, re relocated. So uh, it's certainly, you know, I've walked through there a number of times. Uh, it, it is still a living you know, and changing, as, as he said, the, the, uh, the neighborhood, the Charles River Park, if you call it a neighborhood. Uh, I like some of the new work that's there, the villas, and uh, you know, they've added some scale. But it certainly is not the, the row houses and the, uh, the dense urban fabric that, uh, that my grandfather would have known as a young boy in Boston. So, uh, but uh, passing in uh, certainly of uh, uh, an era. Uh, some, some, uh, up, so, uh, any, any comment? Inadvertent. Um, things looking up, I guess, looking up for the uh, um, uh, Church of the Blessed Sacrament Church building in JP. Um, it's been off and on for, for years. So we're trying to kind of save and redevelop the building. There was many years ago, there was housing that was built along sort of the perimeter of the larger of the block itself. Uh, but now there's a, there was a designation of Penrose uh, winning proposal for uh, mixed use for affordable housing and performance space. The Colonnade Hotel celebrating 50 years. Um, they um, are celebrating by, you know, they re have refreshed the interior. Uh, there's a, a story talking about how they stripped off some of the traditional mahogany paneling to expose the concrete and uh, some of the interior is really celebrating the, brut the, the brutalist uh, design. Um, I can find uh, the original, I was dying to know who the original architect was. So if anyone knows, I'm, I've, I've been there, but I couldn't find anything in the Southworths uh, guide to Boston architecture or um, Mark and Chris's heroic book or anything, but, but I don't know, I'm just curious who the architects were, but anyhow. Um, the, uh, moving up to Amesbury, uh, great story. Looking through my actual newspaper articles that I've put to find the uh, little tidbits of, of information, but uh, it's great that the uh, these uh, students at the Whittier Regional Oak Tech High School uh, did research uh, in, in Amesbury, uh, looking at um, mill wheels and I really wanted, and you can see there are little plaques on these uh, bike racks so that they they did research, they actually did a did CAD and, uh, and, uh, and fabrication, um, and um, so they so they actually did the the design, the research, the making of them, uh, creating these really evocative and beautiful uh, beautiful bike racks that will help to revitalize uh, their um, uh, area around the market square. Uh, sort of, a, but uh, definitely uh, you know a nod to the little to the Powah River, which comes down through the upper, I guess through both mill yards in the history. Nice story. Half pasture pumping station. The uh, UMass Building Authority has uh, issued an RFP for to redevelop this um, long neglected, uh, not needed for you know, it's been decades, um, beautiful stone structure um, on uh, what's now known as Columbia Point, and. Um, these are actually these are my pictures. I have a sort of a, a personal interest in this. I was excited to see something's going to happen because way back when, at the turn of the century, uh, I put together uh, for the, the BAC. Uh, the BAC has, I assume they still do, have a BSA scholarship program, and so it was a it was a long like a, an intense weekend comp design competition for a small amount of money. And so I, um, I was chair of the, the, the committee and developed, uh, kind of developed the program and also these, uh, these drawings. I got a chance to tour the building and then develop some, trying to just create as much uh, background you know, drawings and base drawings as possible because it was a, an intense program. 
a lot of fun to do in a, in a, uh, in a weekend. And they did a great job. So um, Robert E. Lee uh, story. Um, and both in Richmond and Charlottesville, uh, things that uh, sort of undeveloped uh, moved along to this week, which is that the outgoing Governor Northam, um, the, uh, the, the pedestal that was remaining uh, on Monument Avenue in Richmond, covered with graffiti, uh, they had planned to uh, keep it. Uh, I think that was, I think there would be a good argument to, to do that, keep it in that sort of transformed state as a um, um, you know, showing us sort of the layers of all the, the, the context and the, and, the, and the controversy and, and so on. But uh, they abruptly changed course and, uh, and they're now dismantling it, which on the lower, lower right was when they're starting the scaffolding to prep for that. So it will be, I think, deconstructed. Uh, as far as I know, the pieces will be saved. Uh, over in Charlottesville, well, which is the, the statue that uh, is where they will uh, unite the right, uh, the tragedy, the, the, uh, the riot and the um, tragedy there with Heather Heyer and so on. Um, the, they have, have made the decision to actually melt down the Robert E. Lee statue uh, and they've designated uh, uh, an arts group that will, uh, will actually, so they're actually repurposing the metal itself, uh, creating, a, they'll be creating a sculpture from the metal from the, from the statue itself. So uh, it's like, wow. A uh, couple of different uh, projects uh, on both sides of the pond here uh, that are connected to uh, a Foster and Partners uh, architectural firm. Um, the, the tower, the, uh, the so-called tulip, you can see there on the upper right picture, was, uh, was rejected uh, last month by the uh, UK government, rejected the design. Um, why? Uh, and, the, uh, there's, a, there's a great article I recommend. I don't want to spend too much time on it, but it's in the, in the bibliography. I'll, I'll share the people who hadn't gotten before the, uh, uh, the bibliography, but it's uh, in Slate magazine. And so here, you know, it, it was a rejection of this tower that really didn't, for all of the, the, the carbon and the energy and so on, all it was was it, uh, proposed as a viewing tower. Uh, no housing, no office, no, you know, it was just creating this concrete uh, kind of viewing tower. But it was rejected not only for, you know, what you might say is the, because the, you can see the skyline, obviously it has some iconic and really interesting or, you know, bizarre shaped buildings, the shard and all that, but, but they were really discussing sustainability, uh, you know, and referring to you know, it as a you know, unsustainable whole life cycle. Um, so we, while especially those of us in preservation uh, uh, within our community, we're definitely on the cutting edge of talking about uh, net zero and carbon uh, and the, the whole life you know, looking at buildings, uh, the entire uh, life cycle. Uh, I thought it was interesting that in more of the sort of more popular press, they're beginning to see the we're talking about. Uh, not just uh, the energy, and you know, if you're just comparing gas, gas-fired and coal you know, versus electric, then my and might say, yeah, the new, new construction makes sense if it's electric. But looking at the whole picture, of, uh, uh, including demolition of exist what's there before and all that, so uh, makes reference to the uh, you know the greenest building is the one already there and so on. But I recommend the article, uh, just uh, kind of uh, interesting. Uh, by the same token. Um, this other uh, billionaire uh, Upper West Side Manhattan was pictured here. Has proposed this, this two-story pristine glass box atop his uh, his uh, the co-op building, the pre-war uh, uh, co-op building where he lives. Where you could say on the one hand, okay, it's it is very, I mean, it's it's very elegant, and you know, it's uh, how much of an impact would it make? 
but it really uh, had elicited a very strong reactions at the Landmarks Preservation Commission. Um, and not so much because of the design itself, but because of the fear of the precedent that the project might set. And so there's a little bit of this sense of, well, if, you know, are we going to let all billionaires just get to do because they can uh, do this? The, the title of the article in the New York Times was, What if Elon Musk wants to build a rocket on the roof of the Dakota building? Um, the iconic Dakota building. So um, kind, of a, kind of interesting that in both these cases, they're really bringing in this much a sort of bigger picture. Um, defending the, 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 uh, the, the billionaire, <laughs> defending the project though, did come well prepared to the hearing with a whole roster of like world-class architectural historians and uh, some of the neighbors that you know, really uh, trying to push, push the project along. So. That's a, it's a screenshot of the, the uh, article and uh, talking about some of the reasons they, they cited, including the uh, very high embodied energy. In Barcelona, Barcelona, the uh, Sagrada Familia Basilica, uh, a controversial, you know, it's of course, it, uh, it was begun in 1882, a year before Gaudi. Uh, who's, it's considered as masterpiece, but uh, he took over the project in 1883, uh, worked on it uh, until he died, I'm pretty sure. Uh, and then construction has continued, and, and 2026 is the targeted date for completion. I mean, there have been a number of changes uh, and additions and changing course, but I guess this particular uh, star, this. Uh, uh, massive and very heavy star to go top the Virgin Mary Tower uh, has so elicited some uh, some controversy. Um, even more than that, I think, and I'm not sure looking at the aerial photo, but I think what's even more of concern is that the uh, original design included a, a massive uh, staircase leading up to the basilica, and and, and there's talk about trying to trying to realize that scheme, but it would involve demolishing three entire city blocks and, uh, and displacing, I guess, you know, some thousands of people. So uh, something else to stay tuned for. Back in the States, uh, it's in National Park Service news that uh, there are seven new uh, tribal historic preservation agreements are completed uh, in seven states, various tribes. So. Uh, there are, maybe not everyone knows that, you know, we, we know about our state, the SHPOs, the State Historic Preservation Offices. Well, there also are the Tribal Historic Preservation Offices that administer uh, and review projects. Um, a story in the, uh, in the Globe recently about uh, how uh, historical tours uh, and exhibits and, and so on are really reaching deeper to include the people who have been have been left out. And um, it's a, a great survey. It's an article by John Marcus. Uh, but uh, I was talking about all the really a sort of focus uh, Asian American history, women's history, uh, Black history towards LGBTQ, uh, Native American, uh, even a bike, uh, like civil bikes is a sort of a you know, bike tour that goes to look at spots, civil rights sites. So uh, Great to see uh, more of the story. Uh, the, uh, sometimes the 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 unpleasant, but the, you know, uh, unfiltered truth. Uh, kind of related in that uh, local, local developers. There was in Memphis, uh, Atlanta, I think, is another one. But uh, here, um, this uh, site in uh, Memphis, um, uh, Green. Um, uh, I want to say grain elevator, but uh, anyway, the, uh, the site that's uh, being being repurposed uh, for cultural space uh, by you know really the kind of the you say up and up and coming uh, you know, uh, you know de developer local uh, local developers uh, and groups that really have a stake and uh, and, uh, and grew up 
in, in these areas and just saw them as uh, have been, been neglected and forgotten, but uh, really hoping to revitalize the area instead of uh, just being, <clears throat> being neglected. Late breaking news, I just, uh, just saw an executive a transition of the, the preservation mass. Uh, Jim Igo, after his long career, is he's stepping, he's staying, uh, um, transitioning into a into a new role as a special uh, uh, um, advisor. Uh, and Aaron Kelly is uh, advancing to uh, executive director. Uh, I think this is all going to be as of January 1st. So congratulations to Aaron. I'm sure we'll I look forward to working with her as as people have been. Uh, she's really been, as she noted, uh, been there at the Preservation Mass almost about the same amount of time as, as Jim and, and they've worked, worked together. So congrats on, on that. So thanks for bearing with me on that. Uh, there is a, in the, my the bibliography, uh, you know, if there are any of those stories you want to learn more about, then uh, you can uh, link to them. And, and now uh, really uh, excited to hear from Allison Frazee, Boston Preservation Alliance, to um, tell us uh, to sort of look back and look forward. Uh, so uh, in Boston Preservation Community, and I'm going to stop my sharing. Thanks, Jack. I'll go ahead and share my screen and get started here. And I'm assuming that everyone knows, knows you and that you've been, you know, a long introduction, but uh, you've certainly uh, been involved yeah. in Boston preservation uh, for, for a long time. Yeah, yeah. So Enjoy. first, thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm really delighted to be here this morning to give you a little idea of what we've been up to at the Alliance over the past year. Um, and then at the end, a couple minutes of what we're thinking about for next year. I'm Allison Frazee. I'm assistant director at the Boston Preservation Alliance. <clears throat> and we may have Greg jump in. I think he had a conflict this morning, but our executive director is Greg Gaylor. You see our emails there. Um, Greg and I have both been at the Alliance. Um, Greg, about nine years, me about eight and a half. And the Alliance, for those of you that don't know, we are um, Boston's leading nonprofit advocate for historic preservation. We've been around for a little over 40 years. Um, so we work across the board, um, as you'll see as I go through with um, everybody from the mayor's office on down through city hall, community members across the city, um, and then uh, state and regional and national partners. So we, we try and um, find collaboration wherever we can. Um, uh, so what I'd like to do is go through uh, a few of the things we've been working on and um, it, it, it's a lot. As I was putting this together, I realized how much we've actually engaged with over the past year. So I'm really just going to touch on a few things. But if you, uh, I've tried to save some time at the end. If there are questions, I'm happy to answer questions or, or go into more detail about anything that I um, brought up. Or if there's a project you really want us to know about that you think we may maybe had a role in, I'm happy to talk about that too. So I'm going to start with um, 2021 in review, some of the, the work that we've done with our partners at the city, um, and then our national partners, and then some local projects, um, some of many, many local projects. The Alliance works closely with city staff at the Landmarks Commission, as, as we always have, um, and then other folks at the Environment Department. Um, we work with the BPDA and their design review staff and project managers, uh, BCDC staff and committee members. We, we engage with them regularly and many others. Uh, I'll walk you through a few of the initiatives we've been working on this year with various departments and leadership within local government. Um, as we always have, the Alliance continues to work closely with the Boston Landmarks Commission and we know that the staff there is stretched pretty thin. They have a lot on their plates and, uh, and now they have some open staff positions, including staff architects. So um, they have a, a lot to do this coming year and we hope to work closely with them. 
We testified at budget hearings this year to try to advocate for an increase in BLC's budget in order to hire new staff, increase the salaries for current staff, which um, is well-deserved and also hopefully will reduce turnover uh, to make those the salaries for staff equivalent to similar positions in other cities, which they haven't been, and provide resources for a citywide survey of historic resources, which Boston doesn't have. If you're familiar with MACRIS or our online database, we have surveys of some properties across the city, but not all. A lot of our surveys are 30 years old um, and, and really out of date. So we very much need a citywide comprehensive survey of historic resources that will allow us to be more proactive in our advocacy. So we, we pushed for funding for some of these things. Um, and we, we were successful. We did get an increase in the budget. The staff salaries saw an increase. We saw one or two new positions become available in the budget. I don't, they haven't been filled yet, but um, we're excited about that. So, you know, we haven't seen an increase to BLC's budget in a long time. So we, we felt like that was a win, but we still have a, a long way to go um, to get that department fully staffed and operating on all cylinders. And the goal is to, is to get them resourced in a way that they can really be more proactive, that, that they can participate um, in development review meetings and be more active out in the community um, and play a larger role in discussions about preservation. And, and they, they haven't been able to do that with their current uh, limited resources. So that's something we advocate strongly for and will continue to in, into the future. We've also been pushing for years to address the significant backlog of pending landmarks. So if, if you're not familiar with the process, I expect most of you are, the first step to landmark a property, which is the highest level of protection the city offers, is to submit a petition signed by 10 Boston voters uh, and a little bit of information about the property itself. When that's accepted by the Landmarks Commission, a study report needs to be written that outlines the history and significance of the property. In the past, these study reports have just been massive. And they've, they've been like um, huge research projects that take a lot of time. Um, but, and this, is, this part of the process is where dozens of petitions have gotten stuck for decades. Some of these have been sitting here since the 70s. And there's different reasons for that. Sometimes it's because the property was um, put on the list as a pending landmark because there was a threat to it and then the threat went away so that petition sort of got put on the back burner sometimes it's just been a capacity issue they, they couldn't staff couldn't get to them all thankfully they've um, been reviewing this process and um, they, they've changed it so that the study report doesn't have to be so comprehensive they've streamlined that they've um, been allowing contracted physicians to do the study reports so that staff isn't um, has to do them all by themselves. So it's, it's not a perfect process yet. Um, we've, we've been working with them to try and figure out some ways to make this go a little smoother. But the good news is, is that the Landmarks Commission has been getting through some of these pending landmarks this year, um, slowly but surely, and they're working really hard. So we wanna give them a lot of credit for, for getting some of these wrapped up. And we're super excited to see the Shirley Eustace Estate in Roxbury um, is officially a new Boston landmark. It got through the process this year, and that's that's really exciting. If you've never been there, it's uh, a really wonderful experience. It, it really illuminates the fact that we have a lot of history in the city that's not downtown. It's not on the Freedom Trail. It's, it's out in Roxbury, and it tells a broader history of the city. So I'm hoping that we'll see more landmarks outside of downtown uh, get people off the Freedom Trail, get our visitors out into the neighborhoods and, and really understand the true history of all of Boston. So we're excited about that. This year saw progress towards resolving another problem in our preservation toolkit. Um, in our existing process, only those resources that are determined to have historic significance beyond the local level. So they have to be significant to the state, the region or the national level can be designated as a local landmark. And if you're thinking that doesn't make sense, you're right. This isn't the case in any other major city in the country that we know of, and it certainly doesn't make sense here in Boston, but it's the way that our rules were written. Um, so what that means is that many places 
in Boston that tell the history and the stories of our black, brown, Asian, LGBTQ women's histories, they aren't able to meet that high threshold, sometimes because there simply isn't enough surviving documentation or research. Um, and it has nothing to do with how significant the property is. We just don't have the documentation to prove its significance. So that's something that's, that's been needing to be changed for a long, long time. And we've made a lot of strides with that this year, thanks to Councillor Bach, who has proven to be a champion for historic preservation. I'm gonna mention her several times. Um, and you'll see a picture of uh, Greg there, that's our executive director. And uh, we testified at city council this year several times in support of this language change. And we worked with some other partners like the Greater Boston Real Estate Board who had some concerns about this language change. And we were able to work through it and find a compromise that they, they would support as well, which was really important because the next, it, it, it was approved at city council, now it has to go to the state house. And we're gonna need as much support as we can to get this language changed so that we can landmark properties in Boston that are significant just at the local level. We don't need to prove that extra level of significance in order to landmark them. So that's a huge deal. It's really a game changer for what we'll be able to preserve here in Boston. Um, and we'll be reaching out to all of our supporters, all of you, um, everybody in the preservation community for support once this gets to the state house and make sure that we don't have any problem getting it passed. Another effort um, spearheaded by Councillor Bach is the formation of a commemoration commission in preparation for some upcoming anniversaries, the Boston's 400th and the 250th anniversary of 1776. So this commission serves multiple purposes. Um, and one of those is to shed light on the need for more preservation tools. Uh, the Alliance has testified in support, that's what I'm doing in that picture, and contributed to working sessions to revise language for the commission. And we are, the Alliance is named, you'll see there, as one of the organizations that will be serving on the commission. So there's quite a few named positions and seats on this commission. Um, they're gonna be divided into three subcommittees that are focusing on specific tasks. We'll be on the subcommittee focusing on legislation and tools. So uh, we'll be able in, into the next year to continue to work with other partners at the city and in the community to redefine what tools we have in Boston for preservation. Um, and it, it's really a brilliant idea from Councillor Bach because um, I, I wasn't around then, but I, I hear that during the bicentennial, there was um, a big push for preservation, for learning about history, for making new tools for preservation. And we sort of want to take that energy again and um, revitalize what we have and, and how we do preservation in the city now that things have changed. And it's also an opportunity to recognize, as I said before, all of the history of Boston. Um, Councilor Bach is, is very intentional about wanting to find the stories of, of people that, that weren't heard before or that weren't recognized before and make sure that every part of the city is celebrated and every history in the city is told. So that's a really exciting collaboration and um, we're looking forward to seeing where that goes. I think it's, it's had a ton of support. So I'm expecting that to be successful and move forward next year. Now I'd like to update you on some of the work the Alliance is doing with our national partners, bringing knowledge and experience from around the country right back here to Boston and vice versa. We're sharing a lot of our experience with our national partners um, and, and letting them know what's happening here in Boston. We are active with the Preservation Partners Network, which is an independent organization that formed when the National Trust for Historic Preservation no longer wanted to manage its informal partners network. Uh, I think that they had too much on their plate at the time or for whatever reason, they weren't, they weren't managing their partners network anymore. And so this group formed their own group. Greg is on the board of directors and serves as chair of the education and advocacy committee there. We are also working closely with the Preservation Priorities Task Force, which is a collaboration between the National Preservation Partners Network and the National Trust. Greg is on the steering committee for that. Um, there are four working groups focused on major issues, which you can see here, affordable housing and density, diversity, inclusion, and racial justice, 
sustainability and climate action, and trades training and workforce development. I am um, serving on the sustainability and climate action task force. And uh, my role is managing discussions about policy. I'm really focused on what policies are out there um, and how we can bring some of those policies to Boston. One of the things I'm doing right now, which I'm really excited about, um, we're working to create an online database, a map of the country populated with policies related to climate action in different US cities of all sizes. So the, the idea is that if you are, are working in your local municipality and you wanna advocate for a certain policy, you can find a city that's the same size as yours or maybe is facing the same threats, whether that be sea level rise or fire or heat island effects. You can search by effect or by size of city or policy type and you will be able to find who is using that policy in the city. Um, so for example, whenever we go and talk to people at the city and, and suggest different policies, such as maybe a deconstruction policy or a requirement, if a building is gonna be demolished, that it has to be deconstructed and the material salvaged and reused. Other cities are doing that. So this map will be a place where you can go, see what cities are doing it, find out how it's working, what they've learned, get contact information, for the, the people running the program and take that information back to your local government and say, here are the places where it's really working well. Here's what they did. Here's why we think it would work well in Boston because of these parallels. Or maybe um, here's where we think we would change it for Boston because we're different from the city in this way. So I, I think that's gonna be a really useful tool. We're currently collecting policies from around the country so that we can build this out. But we also need funding. So if anybody knows of a funding source that might be interested in that kind of a project, please let me know because um, you know now's the time to, to get that off the ground. I think it would be really useful for people all over the country. Uh, I'm, another project that I'm, I'm hoping to get going um, next year is a communications campaign, a messaging campaign about preservation and climate action with some key taglines like you see here, and you've probably heard these things over and over at this point, um, but it takes 10 to 80 years of an energy efficient new building to make up for the negative climate change impacts of construction. Building reuse almost always offers environmental savings over demolition and new construction. We're using the phrase more often, um, building reuse is climate action uh, to try and press that uh, we need to, to use the building stock we already have rather than demolish it and, and build new. As green as that new construction might be, it doesn't usually counter the effects of demolition. Um, you know, so, some of this has been around for a long time. You may have seen bumper stickers that say gut fish, not houses, um, to try and, and discourage people from gutting houses, which has been a big trend for a long time. So I think in my mind um, and in my experience, these conversations are happening all the time, all over the place. There's, there's dozens of groups, even in just Boston, talking about climate action. Um, there was just the other day, uh, Boston's Green New Deal meeting that had over 80 local advocates on the call, all talking about some of these issues. Um, and uh, what I wanna make sure is that historic preservation is a key component of those conversations. Sometimes people, are under the impression that, that old buildings are bad and you know you can't bring them up to energy efficiency and uh, you, you need to tear down the old buildings and build new green ones. And, and we wanna make sure that people understand that that's not um, the best, best solution and make sure that they know what the alternatives are um, and that historic preservation is a big part of those conversations. So I, I get on as many of those calls as I can but there, there's a lot happening that I think don't have a preservation voice. So if we can get these, these messages out there, if we can get these one-liners, these, these um, taglines, billboard ads that are really easy to digest and get people sort of thinking in a different way and connect them back to resources. So again, if anybody's interested in helping with this kind of work, um, we're looking for partnerships to, to get these, these messages out there. And we have been working with the BSA on some of this already. One way to best communicate this messaging um, about building reuse is through the numbers themselves. 
So we have partnered with two leading architects in this space, local advocate Lori Ferris from Goody Clancy, who you may know, and California-based Larry Strain from Siegel and Strain Architects. And they have created a model for a carbon calculator. They're calling it the CARE tool, Carbon Avoided Retrofit Estimator. Um, it was called, you may have heard of it already, it was called to build or not to build, because um, in essence, that's what it's doing, is helping determine whether or not to build new um, or to reuse the existing building. But you see here what the tool is like. You um, input a bunch of information about the existing building and your new project, the size, the materials, uh, all kinds of things. And it calculates um, the, the amount of carbon used. We, we were able to um, get a, a grant. The Alliance was able to get a grant, a Mo family fund through the National Trust grant to help get this tool online to create a website for it so that it is free and publicly accessible to anybody that wants to use it. Um, there's, there's what it looks like. Uh, you can, and, and the, the really wonderful thing about this is once it's online and, and people can use it, anybody from developers to local governments can say, put your numbers into this tool, see what it comes out. And maybe we'd even have some governments that say, you will not be allowed to demolish a building unless these numbers um, work out. If, if it's not energy, if, if it's not energy saving, carbon saving, then your project cannot move forward. Um, and that I think would make it a lot easier to advocate for saving buildings because the numbers are right there. And, you know, a lot of times it comes down to numbers. Um, so this is a really cool tool. Um, they've been sort of shopping it around and uh, they're also looking for funding. So um, if this is something that, that you know someone would be interested in funding, we think this is going to be a, a game changer in this space, and we'd love to get it online and available to whomever would find it useful. Speaking of uh, the National Trust, this year we also successfully listed Boston on the 11 most endangered historic places in the country, which is not a list you really want to be on, but since uh, we, we had a good reason for it, we thought it would be helpful. We worked really closely with Joe Bagley, who was mentioned earlier. He's the city archeologist at the Boston Landmarks Commission and a rock star. He's, he's just doing wonderful work there. We were able to get the historic resources at the Boston Harbor Islands listed because of the imminent threats of climate change. It was the only New England listing this year. And we hope to bring awareness to the need to document the Harbor Islands before resources are lost forever. So if you're not familiar with what's happening there, um, due to sea level rise and storm events, a lot there's a lot of erosion around the islands and um, especially the Native American artifacts that are underground are just being washed out to sea. Um, so there's this is an urgency to do documentation and archeology span to understand what's there and, um, and have it documented at least before, it, before it's lost forever. It's complicated in that some of the tribes would prefer um, what's underground to be washed to sea, have nature take it back. Some of, uh, my understanding is some of the tribes are okay with the archeology, span but they don't like the resources to be put on display or in a museum, especially if it involves human remains or gravesite situations. So um, Joe Bagley really, has had a challenge of, of how to handle these. And that's why we felt like getting national attention for it would be helpful to bring in some other partners and resources. And we, we also felt that this is something that um, any coastal city or any city on a, a waterway would be facing. So we wanted to bring attention and sort of raise the red flag for other cities to do archeology span before resources are lost to sea level rise and, and storm events. So that's something else we, we were able to do this year. Um, it's been a busy year. Uh, Alliance staff, um, me and Greg, spent over 350 hours working on over 100 projects and initiatives over the past year, all to protect, promote, and preserve local historic resources. I picked a sample of projects to share with you today, though many others can be found on our website. So you see it right there, bostonpreservation.org. If you go there, we have project pages um, where I, I try to keep them up to date with the meetings that we have, letters that we write, 
Um, I link back to the BPDA's project pages where you can find the presentations from the proponents. And I, I try to let you know what our positions are on different projects where we're coming down um, on, on each situation. So if you're interested in our work, always go check out our, our preservation project pages on our website. You can sort them by neighborhood. Um, if you if you just like to be interested and kept in the loop in your specific neighborhood, we also have an e-news that we send out that uh, we keep um, people apprised of our, our bigger projects that we're working on. So definitely sign up for that if you haven't already. I'm going to go through a few projects that we worked on this year. Again, this is just a sample, sort of a random sample of some of the things that we worked on. Um, and I, I'm happy to go back at the end if there are questions about any of these. The first one I wanted to tell you about, which uh, you may have already heard about, is the MGH new clinical buildings in the West End. So I would bet everyone on this call is familiar with what urban renewal did to the West End in the 50s and 60s, um, just really obliterated what was there. And there aren't that many buildings that survived urban renewal. We count about a dozen, depending on what you count um, as being in the West End. Here you see three of those buildings, the Winchell School, the West End House, and a tenement house. And uh, they're all owned by Mass General Hospital. And a couple of years ago, MGH made it known that they were planning to expand their hospital campus and would be clearing the site. So we immediately pushed back and we gathered stakeholders in the neighborhood, which included um, the West End Museum, Beacon Hill Civic Association, West End Civic, the library, the Old West Church, H&E, everybody um, that is active in that area. And we all came together and discussed what, what next steps should be. And there was a huge, just a very clear call for preservation. Um, everyone in the neighborhood felt strongly that these buildings were important. Many of them had personal experiences um, you know, they went to the West End House as a youth, or they went to the school. They felt, even those that didn't have a personal connection, felt that these were sort of the last remnants of what this neighborhood used to be. They tell the story of the neighborhood uh, and felt very strongly that they should be preserved. So we spent years, um, two years, working with MGH in the neighborhood to try to find a solution. We, we asked MGH to explore every option we could think of moving the buildings to Cambridge Street, finding somewhere else in the neighborhood to move them to. Um, but because, and this is um, there, you can see in the middle there, the two big clinical buildings, because of the uh, needs that they said they had for hospital beds, for circulation within the hospital, for underground parking, um, they, they were not able to find a compromise that worked for them. So, we, we are gonna lose all three of the buildings, unfortunately. And as much of a loss, you know, we, we feel that loss very deeply, um, but it's not a complete loss. We were able to negotiate quite a bit of mitigation for the, the groups that I mentioned and many others, um, financial mitigation. So, you know, the West End and, and some of these other groups that tell the stories of this neighborhood will be better funded to do so moving into the future. Um, and we are excited to see what they'll do to keep, continue the stories and the memories of that neighborhood. Um, we had a lot of, of help through that process with Councillor Bach and Jay Livingstone and other elected officials. And like I said, we worked very closely with the community to understand what they wanted. Uh, one thing I do feel like I need to mention about this project is that MGH does plan to reconstruct the corner of the Winchell School near its original location. My understanding is they'll, they'll take it down and then reconstruct part of it here within their, their new building. This was not something that we, the Alliance asked for. We don't really consider it a preservation solution or mitigation for the loss of the buildings, but it was something that the, the neighborhood, the residents felt was meaningful to them. So I, I believe this is still in the plan um, to reconstruct that part of the school there. And it'll help, you know, if there's tours of the neighborhood, they can point out this is where the Winchell School used to be. So I wanted to make sure I included that. The next project I wanted to tell you about is Amarin's in South Boston. You're probably familiar with it. It's a really iconic corner building on West Broadway. And it's also an iconic restaurant. It's been there for a long time. 
My husband and I go there every year for his birthday because they have really good pumpkin risotto. Um, but as you may know, Mall's Diner across the street is gone and um, Amaranth was put up for sale. We signaled, as soon as we heard about it, we signaled to the BPDA very clearly that if anybody bought this and proposed to demolish it, there would be strong opposition. So when the developer first released plans, we were pleased to see that it included preservation of the entire building and uh, a new structure in the parking lot beside it. Um, so we were happy with that, but then, you know, nothing's ever easy. When the IAG formed the Impact Advisory Group, which is formed um, by the, the BPDA to help advise the, through the process, um, they balked at the height of the new construction. They felt it was, it was too tall. It didn't meet the height guidelines for the neighborhood. And they suggested sacrificing amaranths if it meant reducing the height of the overall project. There was a lot of meetings, a lot of comments. Members of the IAG said things like they felt this building was nostalgic, but not historic. So um, as you probably know, the IAG is a small sample of local um, abutters, and there are a much broader representation across the neighborhood of people that really did feel a connection to this building and wanted preservation. So we sounded the alarm. We have an Alliance alert system and, and we let it be known that this was happening. And a, a lot of other people from the neighborhood showed up to meetings, elected officials, um, and, and made it be known that this building could not be lost, that it was really important. So the developer kept working on it and landed at a place which we are seeing more and more often which is a, a facade project. Um, so you see there the rendering of, I, I think, the, what's been approved over the summer. And what they're doing is they're going, to they're going to stabilize the front and side facades, sort of like you see in that other picture, and build the new building sort of within and behind. Uh, so it's, it's a shell, really. It's, it's two sides of the building that will be preserved, but they do plan to restore the fabric that's there um, and some version of Amarin's, uh, some Amarin's like restaurant will be down at the bottom. So the spirit of Amarin's, the feel of the building will remain, um, but it, it's definitely not what we were hoping for. Uh, facade projects are never our go-to solution. They're not ideal, but sometimes it's all we get. And um, we just try to make the new project as good as we can. And that for a facade solution, that means setting the new building back so that the um, historic facade sort of has a little prominence on the streetscape and still feels like its own individual building. Uh, next, I wanted to talk about Villa Victoria in the South End. Um, so moving from South Boston to the South End, South, South End is a landmark district and therefore protected, or, or so we'd like to hope. The Villa Victoria at 85 West Newton Street um, it included, it had a, a church building and a parish house connected. Um, the church in, is owned or was owned by EBA, which is a nonprofit celebrated for um, championing affordable housing and community programming. Um, they're just really beloved in the neighborhood. But historic preservation was not in their mission. Um, so when these, these buildings were showing signs of, of de deferred maintenance and um, when it was time to do some work on the buildings, they found that there was actually a lot more work to be done than they expected. And it's, it was a lot more expensive. And they, rather than um, devote significant financial resources to restoring a building that didn't really work for their programming anyway, they wanted to demolish it and build a building that worked better for them. Um, so because it's in a historic district, you know, you're rarely gonna get, if ever, permission from a district commission to demolish a building. So in the end, after a lot of conversation, a lot of trying to find solutions to save the building, trying to be creative about the repairs that were needed, um, they were able to get the paperwork they needed from ISD to demolish the building. So it's, it is gone now. And um, a new project is, has been proposed so I've been to several meetings about the new project. Um, they did bring it to the community first to get some initial feedback. Um, then they, they've been to the Landmark District Commission 
um, for feedback a couple of times, and it's had a public meeting through the BPDA. And at all of those meetings, um, they've, they've gotten a lot of support for this. So I think not only does the neighborhood really love their mission and the work that they do, but they, they like this new building um, and the, the programming that it brings to the neighborhood. So I think what you see on the screen is pretty close to what will be built on this site in the historic district. Um, the, the commission was working with them to tweak some design features, but for the most part, they seemed um, content with what, they, what we see here. So at this point, the Alliance, um, we're, we're not gonna oppose this project, but we are gonna work hard to try and prevent a similar loss um, of historic fabric in a historic district in the future. And the last project I wanted to talk about today is um, another one of those multi-year efforts. A lot of times we, we look at the work that we do and it's hard to tie it up in a little ribbon because these projects take years to get through the process and then get built. The East Parcel is one of several phases of new construction at the Government Center Garage, which is now partially demolished. And uh, some new buildings are finished there. So this is um, one of the later phases of the total project. When this project was originally approved, the plan was for the East Parcel site to have three small buildings, but the MBTA changed course you know, when push came to shove and, and did not allow construction over the subway station. So the proponent had to redesign and they put, instead of three small buildings, one large building further back on the site, which is what you see here. Neighbors and abutters were frustrated by the change and we were concerned about impacts to the Greenway and, and historic resources of the neighborhood. Um, we're also just concerned about the process. We're seeing more and more projects that have been approved come back for um, product project notification changes um, or whole new PNFs that have significant changes from what was approved. And if, if you like us are committing a lot of time and energy into going to these meetings and working to get a project to the best place possible, it gets approved, you know, and a year or two later, it comes back completely different, that's frustrating. So that, that's a concern that we've had. Um, but we did work with this project team and something we're really excited about that's coming out of it is a cultural space. Um, you can see here on the right, there's sort of an independent space there. And that is gonna be dedicated for an interpretive space for the history of the neighborhood. You see the Alliance is named in the memorandum of agreement. So we will be working closely with the team to um, decide what that space will look like and what will be in it. But we're expecting that it'll be a space that tells the story of the neighborhood, of the canal, even of more recent history like the Big Dig um, to show how this neighborhood has evolved over time. So we're really excited about that. I think it could be um, a dynamic space, a destination along the Greenway. I can imagine people starting their day there and learning about the area and then you know, working their way down the Greenway and experiencing all the wonderful spaces there. Um, so hopefully we get a really interesting um, solution here for this space. Uh, now, I just wanted to, to spend a couple minutes talking about 2022. You know, it's, it's hard to know what to expect any given year, but with COVID hanging around and a brand new administration, it's, it's hard ex to know exactly what to expect, but there are some things that we're excited about. Um, and I wanted to just tell you what we're thinking. During the mayoral campaign, as Jack mentioned, we sent questionnaires to both the Wu and Asabi George campaigns with 10 questions related to preservation. Both responded and we made those responsibles, um, responses available on our website. They're still there if you'd like to go read them and I encourage you to do so if you haven't already. Um, from Wu's responses and the various conversations and collaborations we've had with her as a counselor, such as in the picture there, you can see when she was our guest speaker at our 2017 annual meeting, we are optimistic that she understands the importance of preservation and will make it a priority in her administration. We are right now preparing a list of preservation priorities to send to her that we're hoping to have signed by our 40 organizational members and partners um, and others, whoever would like to sign on to demonstrate the strong citywide support for preservation reform. We plan to work closely with her administration on various issues as we continue to push for positive changes. 
For example, we have heard that there have been internal conversations at the Environment Department for the past several months about changes to Article 85, our demolition delay, um, which does not work for anybody. And we, we wanna see some significant changes there. And we know that there have been some, some internal dialogue about that. So we are, will be encouraging that dialogue to move into the public space to allow for a really robust conversation with all stakeholders, um, not only preservationists, but the development community to understand what, what would work better for them as well. Uh, so we can all get on the same page for a solution. And we're, we're confident that the Wu administration will um, encourage and support that kind of dialogue. So like I said, if you haven't already, check out her responses on our website if you want to get a better sense of what her position is on some of our most important priorities. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up there, um, but I'm happy to take any questions or go back to anything if you had anything in particular you wanted more details on. I want to remind you of two things. There's, again, there's much more information about the projects I mentioned. Um, and many of our other initiatives and events on our website. So check that out. And two, we are a membership organization. Um, we are supported by membership and donation. So we have opportunities for individual, corporate, um, and organizational membership. So check that out. And we'd love to have you be a member or just give as an end of year gift. So again, thanks so much for having me. And um, it's always a pleasure to share our work that we're doing. It's, it's my passion and my life. So. I love to talk about it and I'm always happy to share, which I think I'll actually stop sharing now. Thank you, Allison. <clears throat> Excuse me, my voice. <clears throat> Thank you for everything, all that you do, you're doing. So this was great. <clears throat> I'm a little blown away by the East, uh, <laughs> by the Haymarket thing. I hadn't seen that proposal before, but that's, that is quite a, uh, quite a look to it as a bit of form form making. <clears throat> and uh, I was, um, I guess I was particularly taken by the, the Harbor Islands, uh, just that sort of notion of the, uh, the different, all of the, the uh, aspects and themes of, uh, of ethnic, you know, culture, of uh, uh, Native Americans, and the ethnography and the environmental, it's really like, you know, the whole, we have the, these tracks of preservation, and environmental conservation, and how over these last Decade, decade or so, you know, they're really coming together. But you're certainly seeing it there, where you're talking about <clears throat> uh, artifacts washing away, and it's sort of like the the idea about forever wild, and uh, you know, for conservation or, or letting forest fires, you know, burn naturally. It's like, is it allowing nature to take its course? Okay, but on the other hand, if we've already messed with nature and it's, <clears throat> you know, we've already created this impact, are there ways to repair it? But, Anyway, I'll stop talking. And uh, uh, any any other questions or thoughts or comments? Please I see Polly. Polly has her hand raised. Thank you so much, Allison. That was that was great. Really great information. Um, and I I had a question about the the tool that Goody Clancy developed, the sort of embodied carbon tracker. And I, you know, the pessimistic brain kicks in. And are there checks against? developers, or not just, I shouldn't say that, checks against folks kind of manipulating the numbers to um, serve their purposes. Um, is, there, is there a review process or a sort of a, you know, nonpartisan or whatever, you know, a review board that kind of is gonna look at the numbers and where they came from, if this is used, do you think? Or is it, is that, maybe it's not necessary. So, um, and that's a great question. And I think that that would be up to whoever is, is requiring the tool. So like, let's say if Boston, the BPDA required those kind of calculations, they would need to make sure that they're done correctly. Um, so I would hope that there would be a knowledgeable staff person to sort of review the numbers. Um, the tool has been created by architects that, that are preservationists. So I, I assume they're keeping that in mind. Um, obviously we want the numbers to be accurate and reflect the true conditions. It's not always the best choice to save a building. Um, as much as we, we would like that, sometimes the numbers don't work in our favor. So I think that they're trying to create an accurate tool and put in as many um, spaces for information as they can. And, and they've been developing it more and more, making it more sophisticated. And what they told me is that if they have more funding, they can add more layers to it. They can make that tool even more specific. So that's why 
we're looking for funding to um, add some capacity to that tool. And then, like I said, put it online and make it public. So we'll, we'll see where it goes, but I think it could be really useful. Thanks for that question. Any others? <clears throat> Thanks for sharing about the the, the Via Victoria. Um, that was interesting. The, the new design and the sharing of the reactions to it. I, I've been really impressed with what I've seen from the commission. The the uh, the interest in really interesting and high quality new design when there is new design within the historic district. Um, there's been a <clears throat> it's been very you know open minded and creative. Uh, it seems like. Yeah, and it's sort of a sort of a preservation philosophy, right? Because um, as a preservationist and not an architect, I still feel heartsick over the the loss. You know, the it, I I would have loved to see them recreate the church that was lost. You know, rebuild it back the way that it was. But that's that's not always the right solution. Um, and so there's like I said, there's been a ton of support for this really contemporary new building that. The way they describe it is, you know, the, the terracotta um, reflects the masonry tradition of the neighborhood. It's the same scale. So the front part of the building is the same scale and height as the buildings across the street. And then it steps back to match the scale of the buildings behind it. So they have, um, they've, they've tried to make it match the context as much as a contemporary building can. And um, our, the, the advocacy committee in our board feels like it's, it's a very well-designed new contemporary building. And if, if that's the direction that, that we're going, we want something that's very well-designed, so. Hmm. I guess by the same token, I'm thinking about how as time has passed, maybe it's making me feel old, but remembering that like the, uh, the South Cove, uh, manor, the um, uh, nursing home, and you know those were these contemporary buildings that were added in, in I guess that's 1970 or 60, I think 70 or so, that have since moved up, <laughs> have evolved and been demolished and changed. So um, fortunately, so there's this continuity, of course, of this great collection of Victorian buildings, but also <clears throat> things do continue to evolve, and it's a uh, they do, and if you look at our historic yeah. districts, no, you'll city see, should. yeah, you see evolutions of architecture and architectural moments within our historic districts. So what we're doing here is adding today's moment into that evolution of design within the district. So it's um, sometimes it's hard to say goodbye, <laughs> goodbye to, to the to the old stuff, but we welcome the new. Yes. <clears throat> Any other thoughts? Okay, well, thank you again. Allison, thank you for having really appreciate me. appreciate your time and <clears throat> we look forward to reconnecting with you and, and hearing from you and hopefully working with you and as you had solicited. <laughs> um, Please do. If help you... and support in, in different ways. So I yeah, hope that as any... a larger community, we can do that. Please do. If anyone's interested <clears throat> in any of the projects I mentioned, don't hesitate to reach out because we are looking for partners um, to help mm. get these things off the ground. Mm. A great reminder of what the what the Boston Preservation Alliance is and was is formed as a as a consortium and you know partnerships collaboration as you organize your presentation. Absolutely. So, more power to you, as I say. <laughs> so, all right. Now, just a few announcements. Actually, speaking of the South End. Uh, I went, my wife and I went last week to, we had a chance to go to the uh, um, opening for the exhibition about the Architects Collaborative, 1945 to 95. Uh, it's entitled Tracing a Diffuse Architectural Authorship, and it's at the Pink Comma Gallery. Uh, so it's a good way to check out uh, 49 Waltham Street, one of the courtyards that were, uh, um, have been uh, rehabbed there, sort of down towards that. Um, towards um, Harrison Ave. And um, <clears throat> this uh, exhibition was curated by uh, Gabriel Ciro uh, and uh, James Hurd and Emma Pfeiffer. 
uh, Dave uh, was, when was that? A couple of years ago, a um, year and a half ago during the, during our remote period, um, a presenter and guest host for this committee. Um, and uh, so they have that, it's, um, it's a great collection of models and drawings and photos uh, and some quotes uh, from the Architects Collaborative, but really focusing on their their sort of Massachusetts work in particular. So, <clears throat> so I recommend it. It's um, um, you can go through it all. You know, it's really like in fifteen minutes. Uh, you know, it's not a, a lot to see, but it's definitely worth making the trip there. <clears throat> um, otherwise, uh, uh, historic New England. Uh, they want people to know their the sites are are open. Uh, the, the grounds are open. For the winter and then uh, for the holidays a number of the sites have uh, decorated having various events uh coming up tomorrow actually uh part of a, a series Sim simpson gunsworth and hager um uh, they have another i don't know if uh, it's still open if there's still openings but the free webinar sgh webinar and the one tomorrow is six lessons learned on detailing detailing durability from six iconic houses so that's kind of a lunch and learn tomorrow at uh, noontime, one, one AIA credit. <clears throat> and uh, there's a, uh, an architectural plastics preservation, uh, APT, uh, the International their Technical Committees uh, has a workshop on December 16th at uh, 5 p.m. And then just uh, looking forward, heads up for a dismantle preservation. They're having their I mean, another uh, their annual uh, unconference, uh, as they call it. But uh, actually, I guess this one is their spring learning lab, and that's in Old Salem, uh, in Winston Salem, North Carolina. So beyond that, um, there's uh, additional information if you're interested from the agenda. And I hope to see you see you all uh, for our January meeting, January 13th. Um, we will be hosting Christian Simonelli, the executive director of Boston Groundwater Trust. Uh, Lynn Smilich had heard uh, him give a talk, thought it was really wonderful, so uh, she suggested, uh, and he agreed to uh, to present to our to our committee. So uh, we have, that will be another. Um, uh, let's do that as a virtual one. And moving forward, we're we're going to see whether we ease back into for this committee uh, doing a hybrid uh, meeting back at the BSA headquarters. If you guys uh, feel strongly one way or another about we really, really should do that, can't wait to do that, or I'm not sure I'd be comfortable doing that, please just send an email. I'd love to get some feedback and just sort of know, but it seems like we need to sort of wait and see what happens with this, <clears throat> these uh, new outbreaks and everything, I think. <clears throat> So oh, thanks again, everyone, unless there are any parting any thoughts or announcements that I've missed. Anyone want to share? If not, hearing none. <laughs> well, I hope to see you next time. So thanks, guys. And thanks, Allison. Pastor Greg. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Thanks.